Can rip your soul from your seas There's people lie down With no water to drink This is a crazy taste Of reality And all of dying All of breathe, all of die, all of breathe. There was a line up there. Mm. I, I didn't get it. Mm. I short, I short lived my own life. We gotta rise up, oh. We gotta stand up tall. Don't let this world lock you out of your soul. We gotta rise up, oh, we gotta stand up at all, don't let this world lock you out of your soul, hey. A million blessings disguised in their light The darkness in the world is real Have right actions stand on your feet No matter what path we choose Keep on circling the fracture or moon I want people stand up in your night Everything is sacred, everyone is sacred We gotta rise up, oh We gotta stand up tall don't let this world lock you out of your soul We gotta rise up, oh We gotta stand up tall Don't let this world lock you out When we look inside and we see this ember We know this light inside is our love when we look inside, and we see this ember We know this light inside is some child We're imitating stars that move across the shimmer We know this light inside is our love When we look inside and polish the mirror We know this light inside is our love When we look inside, and we see this ember We know this light inside is our love When we look inside can we see this ember? We know this light inside is some child We're imitating stars that move across the shimmer We know this light inside is our love When we look inside and polish the mirror We know this light inside, yeah We gotta rise up, oh We gotta stand up tall Don't let this world lock you out of your soul we gotta rise up, oh We gotta stand up at all Don't let this world lock you out We gotta rise up, oh We gotta stand up at all Don't let this world lock you out of your soul I'm glad you guys are here with this money. <laughs> I am. Of your heart. So
Thank you. 
And hello, friends, and welcome to the Jewish Culture and Holocaust Remembrance Group. And we're talking uh, and having our program today called Stand Up to Jewish Hate. And I'm so happy to see all of you and our friends have returned. And um, we're going to get started um, with a presentation by Jan Landau. Um, Jan is the co-founder of the Butterfly Project in San Diego. And I'm also proud to announce Jan was recently, uh, or just about to be honored for as a woman of valor in San Diego. So congratulations, Jan. And we're gonna start the program uh, with a brief uh, video, which will become obvious. And then we'll turn it over to Jan to kind of create a little bridge on why I chose this video today. The last 
the very last, so richly, brightly, dazzling yellow. Perhaps if the sun's tears would sing against a white stone. Such, such a yellow is carried lightly way up high. It went away, I'm sure, because it wished to kiss the world goodbye. For seven weeks, I've lived in here, penned up inside this ghetto. But I have found my people here. The dandelions pull to me, and the white chestnut candles in the court. Only I never saw another butterfly. That butterfly was the last one. Butterflies don't live in here, in the ghetto. Okay, and we're back. And Jan, please, I, I'm going to uh, allow you to take the screen and take over the program. Take take it away. Yep. Thank you. Well, the poem that you just heard is was the inspiration for the Butterfly Project. And let me see if I can get up our... It was there a minute ago. Jeffrey, do you hear me? Yeah, I hear you, but um, try to okay. close it out and start again. So scroll okay. your screen share. Stop screen sharing? Yeah, and then okay. just screen share again. Okay. I saw it there. Here it is. Ah, here we go. So the, the poem that you just heard was the inspiration for the Butterfly Project. And I just want to take a moment and introduce also Judy Gottschalk is here. Uh, she is on the education team for the Butterfly Project. So Judy, be sure and, and chime in if I for, forget something uh, important. In addition to the uh, inspiration being that poem, it was also, you'll hear later, hopefully from Linda Hooper with the uh, Paper Clips Project. And that certainly was, I had the opportunity in 2005 to visit um, or to see the the uh, paper clips doc documentary and that also um, was the inspiration for the butterfly project so here you see the early days of the butterfly project we, it was called zikaron Viktikva in the beginning which in hebrew means remembrance and hope and this is a picture of my co-founder here in the left hand corner cheryl ratner price who's the artist behind the project initially i uh, as a teacher thinking about what I could do at the San Diego Jewish Academy where I was working to remind children of what happened during the Holocaust, but yet have them be hopeful that if we treat others with respect and kindness, that the world will be a, a different place for everyone, a better place. Um, I thought about what, how I would represent the children uh, that perished during the Holocaust. And again, the poem was the inspiration to have a butterfly represent that. But my interpretation of how children would make those butterflies was very different from uh, the, our artist, Cheryl Ratner Price. Fortunately, she was the one who came up with the idea of a ceramic butterfly, which was long lasting. Uh, we engaged a lot of our Holocaust survivors in the program. Um, we found that that was the most impactful way of talking about the Holocaust to children was to hear their stories and know that so many of them had um, such amazing lessons to be learned. One of them, most importantly, was their hope and, and their gratitude um, for their lives. And we wanted to impart that into children's um, minds that they should be hopeful 
and persevered during difficult times. We'll, we'll have more of that in, in a minute. And unfortunately, when I look at these pictures, it's very sad because many of the survivors you see in this picture are no longer with us. So this is the tree of life that was created at San Diego Jewish Academy. Um, in the root of that tree are paper clips because that was the root, one of the roots of the idea for the project. I'm very grateful to Linda Hooper for doing what she did in Whitwell, Tennessee. So the Butterfly Project is a call to action through education, the arts, and memorial making. We teach social justice through lessons of the Holocaust, educating all about the dangers of hatred and bigotry to cultivate empathy and social responsibility. By painting ceramic butterflies, which are permanently displayed as symbols of resilience and hope, participants remember the 1.5 million children killed in the Holocaust. In this work, the Butterfly Project honors our commitment to the survivors to never forget. Each ceramic butterfly painted, as we said, represents the one, one of the 1.5 million children who were killed in the Holocaust. And if you see in the left-hand corner, it's not just painting the butterfly. It's also, there is a biography card where the child who's painting or the person who's participating in the project reads about a specific child who lost their lives during the Holocaust. In addition to this, we, all of us and the ed team and the Butterfly Project, we go into schools and we give the students a background about the Holocaust. So it's an educational approach and it's not just an art project. So we create butterfly memorials in public spaces as lasting reminders about the dangers of hatred and bigotry. The butterfly symbolizes transformation, hope and resilience to make a better world. The Butterfly Project's Butterflies are being painted and displayed all around the world with the goal of creating 1.5 million, one for each child. We are currently in 49 of the 50 United States and in 24 different countries. Here's an example of, the bio, of a biography card, and I'm gonna have Jeffrey talk about one that's very important to him in just a minute. Well, there's a tremendous story about um, the bio card. My uh, aunt Magda, who was only eight and she was in the cattle car with her family uh, uh, being deported from Kosciuszko in Czechoslovakia. And um, when I first heard about the uh, Butterfly Project is when I moved to San Diego in 20, 20, 2019 actually. And um, their first presentation, I'm honored that both um, Jan and Linda are, re are presenting again. This is the third annual presentation uh, of the Butterfly Project. I am just so uh, emotive about this project. And I um, wanted to create a bio card for my uh, aunt, Magda. And so I created a bio card with a colleague of Jan's. Um, uh, Beth, who uh, manages the bio, uh, biography project for the Butterfly Project. And um, a few weeks later, uh, Beth called me and said, Jeff, why do I have two biograph cards for Magda? And I said, what are you talking about, two? But I did one. Why would you have another? And she didn't understand why there were two. And what, after some ref further research by Beth, it turned out that when she first started this biographical uh, cards program, she went to Yad Vashem, looked up children, and just by mere coincidence, she found a um, registration, which was done by my aunt um, Handy in Argentina for Magda, and picked that um, information and made her own bio card. So it was one of the original bio cards. And it really, uh, every time I see Magda's picture uh, on the bio card, it really is a something, it really connects me to this, um, um, the Butterfly Project. And I hope, Jan, you'll also mention your digital uh, work and the work of your team and how you can actually go and present this anywhere in the world now, and you have. So people who are here from all around the world um, can bring your project to them through Zoom, 
and through your digital programs. And I know you talk more about that later. Yes, thank you. Let's see. Our responsibility as children of survivors is to go into the classrooms and teach children the lessons of the Holocaust, which are appropriate for all children. The goal of the Butterfly Project is to create 1.5 million ceramic butterflies and have them be installed on the walls of schools and churches and synagogues and mosques all over the world to honor those children that lost their lives in the Holocaust and to honor the survivors. Butterfly Project is a nonprofit organization in San Diego run by all retired educators whose parents were survivors of the Holocaust, and they have extraordinary stories to tell. We try to talk to kids, let them know that things can get better, that you can have hope that things will still be good for you. And the only way we can prevent something so horrific as the Holocaust from happening again is for all of us to become upstanders. If we can connect with one or two kids, we've done something right. And that's very important to us. Human greatness does not lie in wealth or power, but in character and goodness and freedom. Remember the past, act responsibly in the present to create a better future. This is just um, some photos of our team working. There's um, Arlene Keyes and Sonia Fox Albaum, who has her father's uniform, which is just when we are in a classroom and show this to the kids and she has them touch it. It's an absolutely awesome experience for them. And it, it is for us, no matter how many times we, we are in the classroom and just seeing the kids' reactions to actually seeing a uniform and seeing a star, is, it's been amazing. So these are the lessons that we emphasize in the classroom um, to the students. These are the lessons that we've learned from health survivors. The necessity of perseverance and resilience, the power of hope, the dangers of hatred, bigotry, bullying, prejudice, and indifference, the profound impact of upstanders for justice and the importance of gratitude. Well, this topic that we're talking about, the Holocaust is extremely sad. Um, we wanna leave the kids with, with hope um, that if they learn these lessons, that as they face obstacles in their own lives today, they, they can persevere. They can, have, they can have a good life, just like the survivors who came to the United States after the war fortunately did have a good life here. So the lessons we bring to schools, we have literature-based lessons for all grades. We have a lesson on anti-bullying, elements of the Holocaust and basic Holocaust lesson are for kids that are probably in the in fourth and fifth grades. The Holocaust Y um, is for usually sixth grade through seventh. It depends, we I speak to each of the teachers that we're presenting in their classrooms and we ask them what the background of their students are. Um, and then we go from there and to determine which of these lessons is appropriate. One of my favorite lessons is through their eyes and that's usually for eighth grade and above through high school. Uh, it's an identity lesson where um, we have quotes from teenagers that are experiencing the Holocaust and that really creates a compassion and identity in, in the students who are the same ages to hear the stories and to realize how lucky they are that they didn't live through this time and what they can do now in terms of social justice to make sure that something like this doesn't happen again to anyone. These are some examples of some installations that we have here in, um, in San Diego. So they, they range from very, very simple to more complex. The most important thing is that they're, that they're put up on the walls so that they're a lasting remembrance 
of what the students have been taught. We do have a, a movie that um, my co-founder Cheryl actually created. It's called Not the Last Butterfly. And it was filmed, a great deal uh, filmed in Poland. And it won so many of these awards, which we're very proud of. And here is a little clip. way Holocaust education was delivered to me was just awful. We want the kids to remember, but we wanted them to feel hopeful. Initiated by the San Diego Jewish Academy in 2006, the project aims to create 1.5 million painted ceramic butterflies in memory of the 1.5 million youth who perished in the Holocaust. Holocaust survivors working with children. We had to wear Jewish stars. When we saw the cattle calf, we realized we are being shipped to a concentration camp. And somebody's calling out my name. Then he said, stay alive so you can tell the world what they're doing to us. And I was 11 years old when I was taken to the concentration camp. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So many of my friends, they're not with us. They were Jewish. This was the only reason that they were murdered. Inspired by an artist. Friedel Brandes helped us to survive. Friedel used art for good to give the children hope, to cope with this shock and the fear. What began in a school? Would you want to wear something like this? Right? It's not just a Jewish project. Inspired people across America. And, I mean, this is like one of the best parts of our lives is when a box comes in. And around the world. That we're able to do this down the road from Auschwitz. There's an important message there. Butterflies are flying in. They're reframing a tragedy to make the world a better place. I've learned that. If I don't do anything, then nothing will change. The Butterfly Project gives a voice back to the anonymous child. This is a lesson for life. Now how, now, how do I get out of here? Here, just stop it. You see? There, there. we go. There yeah. we go. And again, more um, displays. The one on the left is in Spanish. And we were in the Guatemala, as you can see, the Guatemala Holocaust Museum. Here's our team. And we do teacher trainings as well and work with Facing History. And here is Magda, Jeffrey's family. Yeah, and that's the only picture we have of Magda. And these are the cards that, that the students take home with them. The butterflies that they create, of course, are going on to a permanent installation at their schools, but the cards go home and the students have told us a number of times how they had talked to their parents about what the butterfly project means and share with the student, with the, um, the child that they're painting in memory of. 
we always tell them that they are the voice now for that child. This is what the, um, the kit, the butterfly project kit looks like. 36 ceramic butterflies, the bio cards that go with them and all they need to do the um, painting of their butterflies. And then they have to be fired in a kiln and returned to the schools for their display. Let's see why this is not going. I think that's it. Judy, do you have something you want to add? Unmute. And I want to welcome Judy Gottschalk, who's a true friend also from San Diego. And uh, thank you for coming to be with us and support the program today, Judy. Thank you. Thank you. There's a lot of busy Holocaust stuff going on in San Diego today. Um, I just, you know, I'm very honored to be part of this project. Um, you know, uh, I think most all of the team, uh, Sonia, Arlene, Jana, myself, you know, we, we are compelled uh, to do this work. We, um, you know, it's almost like we have uh, our parents sitting on our shoulder, screaming a little bit in our ear in a nice way, but just saying never again, tell the story, talk about, talk about being upstanders, talk about, talk about when you see injustice, do something about it. And I, I think all of our parents would be so happy. Um, you know, the, the most COVID was hard. We, we went, we did it online. We were busy uh, on Zoom, but recently we've started going back into the classrooms and seeing the children and their body language and, and how they react. Um, it has been uh, so satisfying for all of us. And we hope the learning for them is so much richer. Now, I wanted to, before we, uh, Jan has to go, and so does Ju so does Judy. They're uh, launching a brand new Holocaust Museum exhibit, and perhaps um, Jan, you can quickly just share with the group what it is in San Diego. Yeah, we're very excited because this is the first time that San Diego has been supported by the city of San Diego um, with a Holocaust exhibit, and uh, it's the as Jeff said, the grand opening is today. And so we're we're off to that. There, our generations, our San Diego generations of the show has been very instrumental in having this exhibit as well. And so um, we're part of that group and, and wanna be there to celebrate this amazing occurrence. It's given to us for one year and we're hoping that this will be uh, impetus to, to actually have a Holocaust museum here in San Diego, which we are sorely lacking. And um, just to address Ruth, you know, Ruth, I don't know why I said lost. We always say murdered and and killed in the Holocaust. Um, we, um, I, I don't know why I said that, but that uh, to assure you, reassure you, we absolutely do. We do say that the children were killed and are murdered in the Holocaust. Sometimes we say perished, not yeah. sure. We, but also, if you notice on the bio cards, it says very specifically was murdered. Well, I yep. want to I want to thank you and I want to let everyone know that uh, Jan put her email address in the chat. If you are interested in bringing um, and sponsoring the Butterfly Project to come to an institution, not just schools, they also do adult education, they also do churches, they do educating anybody who has an interest in learning about the Holocaust anywhere in the world since their programs are now all digitized and can be done on Zoom. So um, if you're interested in sponsoring them, Jan is, is available on her email. Also, I know if you're interested in a bio card, Jan will be happy to direct you to the right resources within the Butterfly Project for you to be able to uh, sponsor your own Butterfly Project, like Butterfly Bio Card, like I did for Magda. So I wanna thank you both for uh, coming. You're so dear to my heart. And the project is also uh, dear to my heart. So uh, thank you. We won't have you for chat, but we will keep you in mind. And if anybody wants to reach out to both uh, Jan and 
Judy, and I don't know if Judy, you want to put your email address in chat as well. Um, they're they're more than welcome to talk to you. Uh, you. So thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thank you everyone who is here and listening to our pro what our project does. And uh, thanks for your flexibility. And so sorry we have to leave early. Okay, take care. And you can stop thank you all. You can stop your screen share. That would be great. Yeah. Okay. Which I think you have already. I so. did. Yeah. All right. Well, now I'm back. Yep. Here, there you go. So I'm okay. going to continue the program and I want to um, kind of tell you a little bit ahead of what I'm about to do. I found some very interesting uh, video. Um, I'm not going to give it away, but I think we'll talk about it. There's several clips that I want to present throughout the remaining part of the program. I also uh, got a message from uh, Linda Hooper, who's having difficulty this morning uh, personally. So uh, she says she'll try to make it, but we may not see her. Uh, so I want to kind of let everyone know I'm disappointed, but uh, I understand family comes first. So I'm going to do my screen share and um, we'll take it from there. Hold on a second, sorry. Shalom everybody. Welcome Bernie. I haven't seen you for a while. I'm glad you're finally here. Thank you. And now I have the honor and the pleasure of introducing you to Deb Filler. Shalom Aleichem. My name is Deb Filler and my father was a survivor of the Holocaust in the Shoah and uh, dad always felt isolated being in New Zealand. So one of the things that he used to do was turn on TV and he'd say, that's Barbara Eden. She's Jewish. <laughs> and that's Captain Spock, the guy with the pointy ears, he's Jewish. And that's Cat Stevens, he's Jewish. I'd say, Dad, Cat Stevens, what are you talking about? He's not Jewish. He says, yes, yeah, sure, he's Jewish. His name was probably Stephen Katz, and he switched it. <laughs> anyway, see, my father, he would always like to train everything into Yiddish, right? So, what about, no maidel, no kvetch. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm not going to do that. Gerhard, you said you saw it in the camps. My father saw it too, that there was a possibility in the camp to make a joke or a sketch or a laugh. Is it possible that there it's... There were people that were naturally humorous, they, the, the way they behaved. Like when the SS came, the couple carried on, you should have heard them. Like, the next minute he's going to murder us all. And when the SS left, go ahead, he said, do what you want. We were laughing. We were all miserable. But without humor, I don't think we would have survived. Sorry, I didn't find any humor at all. Just sadness and tragedy. I don't know what's funny about anything on the Holocaust. I was a child survivor, so I didn't suffer like some of the older f people here. Um, it's hard for me to understand that they could s see the humor in the Holocaust. Uh, what do you mean afterwards? If there, were f there were funny in incidents after that. I can tell you a whole bunch of those. But uh, during the time that you, that you were uh, deprived of a normal human life, boy. 
I can't even imagine that. Did you enjoy that? Uh, I like to hear the song, but I could not enjoy it. Why not? With an Italian singing a beautiful song. Uh, because I remember for so many youngsters who were perished and they can't enjoy this beautiful place. But you know, and you survive, you're alive. How can you not have pleasure out of the fact that you survive? Always I remember the children screaming, the selection, you know that it's like an hour shadow. You cannot in forget. No, no, you no, cannot, no. You cannot live in the shadow of the of those cries. You have to remember it, but you cannot live in those shadows. I don't live in the shadow, but the shadow is following me all my life. You know, I speak about the Holocaust all the time, but I enjoy life. I am so happy that I have three great grandchildren. Could, could Hitler imagine that I will survive and have three great-grandchildren? I mean, that's my revenge. And so I want to welcome um, to the program uh, Jeff Jeffrey Dembski. And Jeffrey is a professor at St. Bernard Valley College. And he has a tremendously interesting uh, presentation and lecture to provide us. So I'm going to allow uh, Jeffrey to introduce himself and then proceed with his lecture. And you can start your screen share whenever you need to. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, good morning. Just wanted to say at the outset that I, I um, expressed concern to Jeff uh, a few months ago that my presentation would not um, complement the uh, the program, and um, in fact, it works in the opposite direction and may not be something that the listeners wanted to hear. Um, and Jeff said, "Go ahead with it." So I still have the after listening to Jan's wonderful presentation, and I'm familiar with some of of, the, of their work. I still don't think my presentation is appropriate. Uh, for this audience. Uh, but nonetheless, I'm here, uh, and I'll go ahead with it if you'd like. Um, kids nowadays use the word triggering. It is what you think it is. It's something that causes a reaction. For chemists in the audience, of course, catalyst, trigger. Uh, in, in the social science terms currently, just about every language is, in fact, Ruth was triggered earlier, uh, and appropriately so. For Ruth's lived truth. But the slides I'm going to share with you right now, I mean, Jeff, I mean, <laughs> would you want to uh, chime in here? Do you, do you want to? I, I mean, I, I was looking, I think we, they're going to be gone by slide three. They don't want to see any of this. Yes, they do. And I think at the totality of what you're about to share needs to be seen and needs to be educated. We have a very educated uh, audience, yeah. but, you're, I, 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 but let me tell you, this is recorded. And literally hundreds, if not thousands of people, non-Jews, will see your presentation. So all of us in the audience must remember that this is a broader, uh, and we're here all to push back against anti-Semitism and to understand anti-Semitism, though we li live anti-Semitism, each of us, every day. We have a broader mission, and this program is designed to push back against global anti-Semitism. So please, Jeff, don't worry. Uh, you have a very uh, nurturing audience. They all understand your your uh, uh, your reticence, but please go ahead. All right. Well, I'd like to begin just by stating that I'm a, I'm a I'm a tenured college professor. I'm an academic. I publish uh, the the clip Jeff just showed. I wrote the review for that book uh, for the Holocaust Museum. Uh, this is something that I do. But again, I'm an academic. I'm used to speaking to academic audiences, uh, and the things I'm showing are um, again 
their pop culture, their plebeian, they're from the, 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 the current culture, but I, I, I'm... Anti-Semitism is a brand. Uh, that's how I look at anti-Semitism in a marketing sense. It's a brand. Uh, and it has a very loyal and very repeat consumer base. Um, and it's a, a, a global consumer base, of course, and it's a, a, a multi-stream. Uh, Christian anti-Semitism is not the same as Muslim anti-Semitism, uh, though it, they do share uh, some similar core themes. Um, and any brand to be successful has to reinvent itself. Uh, um, um, you remember New Coke? Um, there's many examples of, of, of rebranding, and 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 then that gets me to where my specific research is. Uh, I look at uh, memes, on, uh, logos, logos. Uh, so 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 current internet visual logos that convey core anti-Semitic smears. So you know, Jews are cheap. Uh, Jews like money. Um, you know, you see that from Shylock on, or, or Jews are disloyal, Jews are disruptive, um, Jews uh, profit from war, Jews profit from all sorts of global uh, chaos, uh, Jews run the world, of course, a cabal of Jews. You know, these are all very common, commonly shared, call them transactional, if you'd like. I mean, you need an anti-Semite from over here meets anti-Semite from over there. They'll find some commonality on those, on those, on those slurs. Um, so, in its modern sense, the modern logo for anti-Semitism is Happy Merchant. That's Happy Merchant. Um, happy Merchant is the uh, current visual. About 2000, he came out. Um, you know, the so-called Jewish nose, he is wearing a kippah. Um, his hands are clutched. He looks, you know, covetous. You know, it's based off, based off the Shylock, as I mentioned. That's from the uh, Folger Shakespeare Library in Washington, D.C. Of course, the Merchant of Venice. Uh, in any event, it's the same basic visual. Uh, the Nazis had a similar uh, uh, visual of it. Uh, here it is again. A meme, by definition, is a um, an image that replicates over and over again in different ways. So here's Happy Merchant, and I'll refer to him as Happy. And Happy is the, the, the brand logo that's gonna connect all my slides. And just to give you an upfront, um, sorry, let me come off the screen share for a second. Uh, just to give you an upfront, I'm gonna do a handful, a number of slides on Jews causing 9-11, uh, Israel causing 9-11. Uh, Jews in Israel are not identical, but they get conflated in this space. And then we'll switch to Jews causing COVID. And uh, the one through line on all of that will be it's Happy Merchant, because Happy Merchant is the visual, most visual, recognizable visual of modern day anti-Semitism, at least on the internet. So he's going to be the through line. You're going to see a lot of Happy Merchant here. So first it'll be Happy Merchant uh, and 9-11, and then, and then it'll be Happy Merchant. And there are lots of other cartoons as well, but just wanted to be clear about that. You're going to be seeing a lot of Happy, uh, because again, memes replicate themselves. Um, so Happy. Here he is happy about the gold. Here's happy, his eyes bugging out, his hundred dollar bills. You know, again, a meme is not, they're, they're always a little bit different. That's what a meme is. It's a mutation. It's a, a, a derivation. It's a slice off. So, you know, but you get the point. There's happy, there's the elongated nose turned into a vacuum cleaner to better suck in money and gold. Uh, there's happy, again, the, the, the clock has been, every uh, num numeral uh, has been replaced with uh, an annotation of uh, some sort of uh, money market, you know, the dollar bill, the borsin, the uh, et cetera. And you, you can read, uh, yeah, oh, sometimes memes have captions and sometimes they don't. Uh, they, there's no set rule on that. But I mean, the, the message is clear, you know, you know Jews going to uh, exploit the Christians. Um, interestingly, happy, and, uh, and and this is true as well, uh, uh, when we look at bigotry, and this is something that does connect into something that Jan mentioned, uh, the, uh, the, the, the um, kind of the cross-sectionality of bigotry, uh, you can apply, you know, Jews are not the only allegedly cheap people in the world, I mean, uh, and, and, and you see this with happy, and you see this on the internet, so you'll see the uh, happy logo, which does connote Jews specifically, uh, you'll see it reappropriated uh, to, to also connote uh, non-Jews who are considered to be cheap. Um, so again, here is a happy merchant reconfigured perhaps as an Arab merchant. Uh, here's happy merchant reconfigured as a perhaps Muslim or Sheikh merchant. 
here's happy merchant reconfigured as an oriental uh, or Asian merchant. So the basic idea is still the through line is someone who's exploiting Christians, white Christians, as that term is loosely applied in, in modern day uh, uh, political and, and, and social discourse. So let's just get more now into the specifics that I was discussing before 9-11. So Happy comes out in 2000. It's it's fortuitous uh, for, for the bigots that Happy really becomes prevalent on internet sites in 2000. And by 2001, there it is. So uh, I'll deconstruct the cartoon. Uh, and you'll be seeing it a bunch. Again, Happy's right here in the middle, Star of David on his belt, and he's he's stepping on the on the uh, the detonator that's going to take down uh, World t uh, tr Towers one, two, and also seven. Uh, there's a number. There's a menagerie of people here. I'll be coming back to them. This fellow here, I pointed over, and that's uh, Larry Silverstein, the Israeli uh, Jewish uh, American Israeli American uh, uh, billionaire who owned the towers. And immediately, uh, the anti-Semitism, uh, the, the the turn of the narrative is, of course, that Jews did. 9-11 in order to obtain insurance money. Uh, and so there's a meme, there's a classic meme, Silverstein's face is superimposed uh, behind the towers, the Israeli flag. Uh, there is, in this case, a captioning. And as you can read, this theory goes to the heart of the myth of the greedy Jew. Uh, there's Silverstein as happy merchant. Uh, so again, that is a definition of a meme. You have another replication uh, of the original image. Um, and, and this is the part, Jeff, more than the images, I, I'm, I'm more concerned. Uh, um, <clears throat> listen, folks, I mean, stereotype is, uh, they're, they're not based in fantasy. Stereotypes uh, for whatever culture, whatever, there are aspects of truth. The fisherman, the fish was, was not, was this big. It wasn't this big, right? But the fisherman did go fishing. There was some truth to the, uh, or there was some perception of truth. There was a plausibility to, 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 to the judgment. I don't think people wake up and say, I want to be anti-Semitic. I want to hate Jews. I want to hate Arabs. I think there has to be some sort of, of, of stepping stone uh, that brings people to that sort of um, uh, uh, commitment in their lifestyles. And in this case, so we're going to see a conflation and we're going to see this throughout my slides. And this is what I think is going to make people uncomfortable. Not necessarily the images. You're all adults. You know what these images are. But the analysis. Uh, and I, I'm going to give it to you as unvarnished as I can. Uh, and again, I publish. I have books. I have articles. I have peers who either agree or disagree. And I, I'm open to that. But my feeling was that on a Sunday morning, at least where I am, uh, this was a, 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 a tough fit. Go ahead, Jeff. Well, I wanted to let you know, Jeff, this program was entitled Stand Up for Jewish Hate. And everyone who is here understood the context of the title. And to to make you even more comfortable, if we haven't lost any members <laughs> in the audience yet, since you yeah, I was checking that too. <laughs> I was trying to discourage you from not worrying about it. Yeah. But anybody who is uncomfortable with what you're about to show is can change the channel, which means they can leave Zoom. So please just relax and go. I'm relaxed. It's just you have a hard time saying that to Holocaust survivors when you're talking about, at least I have a hard time. Um, in any event, so so the whole thing is that that Silverstein and the Jews are in it for the insurance money. But, you know, here's the New York Times and it was the largest payout ever to Larry Silverstein. He did go. Now, what? by the way, I want to be clear at 2007 here. Uh, you remember uh, Elliot Spitzer, right? This was before the scandal. I want to be clear here. What business owner is not going to recoup their lo losses? I, that, 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 that's a, a low blow, I think. Of course, you're going to go get your insurance money. But it's the next one. It's the next slide. It's the next slide from, from the same periodical, the New York Times. Uh, because, oh, excuse me, it's the, the journal. He also sued the airlines. <laughs> and he lost that one. Uh, he sought millions from the airlines for, you know, whatever it is he sought. You know. There's the there's the rub. OK, there's hap, there's this there. There's that, you know, definitely get your money back for the buildings. But the anti-Semite is going to look at this. Now, the anti-Semite may or may not be reading the journal, but there is that there that there's this 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 instinct about turning misfortune into some sort of profit speaks to the very kernel of anti-Semitism. And that has not been erased, folks. That's still very much alive and well. Uh, another theory quickly, of course, we'll just be going through these. Uh, uh, Israel uh, was responsible for 9-11. And in fact, 4,000 Israelis were told to stay home. Uh, that got very quick traction online. You, hear, you see here a, uh, uh, um, a tweet about it. Uh, and by the way, if you, I know you're not going to read it, but the return tweet says uh, the Israelis may have stayed home to short American airlines on the stock market because those are the planes. 
In any event, here's where you see this entering the popular ethos. I mean, this is not a Photoshop photo. This is a verified show. Why is this guy, this American guy, why is he standing around with that? Well, what, 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 why is this anti-Semite juiced into that anti-Semitic kernel? Um, he, this guy here doesn't go on the internet and watch Happy Merchant, but his kid does. Uh, by the way, the State Department had to even weigh in on this, the so-called 4,000 Jews rumor. Uh, the claim is totally false, as you see on the bottom, but that doesn't necessarily discourage uh, its replication, its mutation. And in fact, that's what you begin to see. Uh, so it's not just simply uh, uh, that, that, that the Israeli government, it was Mossad, um, and it was Mossad agents. And this is, again, where truth and fiction get very complicated. And they only get complicated, and this is really important, they only get complicated for the thinking person. Uh, <laughs> um Jeff, at this point, may I go on a little long? You're missing your third person. Do you, do you mind, or I'm going to have to tailor this? You could take some more time as whatever you want. All right, thank you. Because if the third person, let me know. But I'm going to either tailor this or go on. Um, folks, this again is where it gets complicated because there. Um, this idea of the so-called dancing Israelis. You see it on the bottom right there. This is uh, taken from the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. It's right in the middle of the campus. Uh, I'm a University of Florida graduate, which is uh, this, uh, you know, that's dancing Israelis there on the bottom. Uh, dancing Israelis, and here you see uh, some photos. Of, the dancing Israelis, again, reference something true. There were five young Israelis who were arrested on September 11th. Uh, and they were arrested because their neighbors noticed that they were over in Jersey City dancing around and taking pictures, the, the pictures you're seeing here, uh, and seemed very happy. And one of the pictures showed a, an Israeli holding a lighted lighter with the wreckage in the background. And there it is. You can see the lighter in his hand. This is the uh, the, 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 the strike off, so it's not in color, but please take my word for it. This is from the real. And these became the uh, dancing Israelis meme. And by the way, it wasn't only the Jews who were allegedly dancing. You might recall former President Trump uh, uh, was very certain that he saw Muslims dancing uh, in Jersey City. Uh, and he's not going to take that back either. But uh, th this idea that um, Semitics and that people in the Middle East were very happy about 9-11 and that Jews were definitely uh, somehow involved with this, that just took off uh, in, in meme culture. And, it, and, it, and this is where it gets really, folks, uh, uh, lock in now because here's where it starts. Um, so the idea that the Jews, again, uh, working, this is the idea that Paul Wolfowitz, there he is, he's the Undersecretary of Defense at that point. Jews in the Bush administration helped Mossad in order to, to push the American war engine into the Middle East to seize the oil, that, that to, to bolster Israel. This is the idea that there was just plotting. Again, this is the, uh, 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 the, the elders of the state, uh, the, the Jewish elders idea that there's this cabal of well-placed Jews controlling world events to start war. That's World War I. That's World War II. Here we are again. It's the same idea that Jews are plotting. Uh, and in this case, it's Jews in the uh, American government plotting with the Israeli government. And this is where it gets ugly because Bibi can't shut his mouth. Uh, and anybody who knows Bibi Netanyahu knows what I'm talking about. And it's nothing against Bibi. It's on and on for so long. By the way, there's uh, Paul Wolfowitz shown right above Happy Merchant from that original. I showed you Silverstein. There's Wolfowitz. Listen, Bibi said the same exact thing. 2008, 9-11 was good for Israel. He said it at Bar El Yan, and it immediately led to cartoons in Israeli newspapers. This is from Haaretz. That's Bibi flying 9-11 into the, the towers. Okay, that's an Israeli cartoon, which did elicit a lot of pushback in Israel, but Haaretz it, it stuck by it. This idea that, 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 that Jews and Israel, that they're all, it's all in it to seize the Middle East, to, to upend up the Middle East, to hurt Arabs, that shows up very heavily in Arab cartoons. Uh, a, a periodical from the United Arab Emirate. You see the uh, Israel is climbing the ladder of opportunity. That is September 11th. Um, again, from the United Arab Emirates, Uncle Sam takes off of his uh, patriotic top hat and it's, it's, it's a kippah. It's, it, it, the, the idea is that the, the Zionist Jews, uh, the American Zionists, they're all, they're all in it together. Uh, this is the last, I want to be clear, I'm going to come off. This is the last political cartoon that the New York Times ever ran. The one I'm showing you right now. It was such a firestorm. There hasn't been another political cartoon in the New York Times since this one. Uh, and you might be able to see why. Uh, it shows Bibi Netanyahu as the dog 
uh, leading a blind and obedient Donald Trump into the Middle East. It's from the this was the last one. Uh, but this idea is still uh, it's a clear idea that that somehow Jews are steering the United States into uh, troubles in the Middle East. That takes its its most relevant it, it, uh, idea in the meme of let American bear. Let American Bear is a Finnish meme, uh, and when Let American Bear was originally created, nothing to do with uh, anti-Semitism at all. It, however, uh, it had to do with American obesity. It had to do with American uh, poor dietary choices, lack of exercise. It was again a Finnish meme, kind of just mocking the fat American idea. Uh, you know, I want a hamburger. Where are the burgers at? Uh, that's a smiley face for, on this bottom part. Where are my burgers? Want my burgers. Again, this is a completely sophomoric, innocuous, funny meme. Has nothing. It's just a you know, little jab at old American diet. Uh, again, are you a burger? Uh, however, what happens to um, uh, Le American Bear is Le American Bear is captured. This happens on internet memes a lot. A meme that's created for X is captured by an, another meme that uh, uh, changes the meaning of the original meme. And uh, so Let American Bear, uh, unfortunately for him, uh, is captured by Happy Merchant. Uh, the internet trolls got him. And at this point, now you see this can be used to convey the message that Jews control America, right? That's how it works. Happy Merchant has figured out a way to scheme, to control, to get America to do what it wants with the fishing hook and the, and the hamburger. And that's the result. The Jews lead the United States into the Middle East. You see the oil derricks back here. It says Allah Allah Akbar as the, the cities are exploding. Uh, and now it is the messaging is, is pretty clear here. Uh, here's Happy Merchant again baiting the to, to give money to Israel. Um it, it memes aren't complicated. Again, baiting uh the United States to go to Iran. Uh, this, again, reinforces the broader idea that Israel and the United States were somehow in on the towers. It was all a thing. Uh, quickly moving through now to COVID, the idea that COVID was a Jewish creation intended to up upend the world and profit Jews through chaos, etc. Basic anti-Semitic theme. Uh, so, again, the Jew flew. You see happy Here's a fun one as far as uh, looking at the imaging. So it, this one slurs Chinese people by, you know, suggesting that they caused the, the koof koof there. And Uncle Sam says, what a crisis. How can I respond to this? And of course, the, the crisis gets gets worse and Sam ponders it more. And it's not a surprising answer. Uh, he's going to have to give the Jews one point five trillion dollars. Uh, because again, the Jews created the virus. They're going to profit for the virus. The date here, March 20, that's about when the sh global shutdowns were starting. Again, happy merchant used to convey the idea that the crisis, the pandemic was actually a Jewish ploy to, to steal from Christians. Very, very basic anti-Semitic plot. Again, happy merchant cl cl uh, clasping at a, a coronavirus shot. Um, Interestingly, uh, the Middle East, uh, take, uh, Middle Eastern nations took a different view. Uh, this is from the uh, Iranian uh, 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 Corona cartoon contest. And you see it's it's actually Uncle Sam here conspiring with the germ dancing on an Israeli to kind of project it onto the world. The protagonist in this case are the uh, uh, Iranian uh, medical staff. Uh, this one's a little bit uh, uh, nuanced. This one's not too nuanced. Clearly, the USA sent the coronavirus to Iran and China from a smirking Donald Trump. Uh, very much alive, folks. These ones right now, for people who are watching in Israel, et cetera, if you're not familiar with the Gaza 48, uh, then I thank you for holding on and holding in. Here's some, some learning for you. Uh, the Gaza 48 conflates uh, pandemic uh, COVID-19 uh, Jewish alleged Jewish orchestrated conspiracy with the uh, takeover of the Israel, the, the, the uh, foundation of Israel in 1948. So here the Palestinian is fighting off the COVID, uh, the Jewish COVID virus on the one hand, uh, and then the Palestinian is holding, uh, they're, they're identified there, the Palestinian flag. Uh, COVID 48 is the idea that the uh, state of Israel has been a uh, a plague on the on the uh, uh, Palestinians as well for quite some time. Uh, here it is again. Uh, it's not really hard to see how the Israel is the COVID tank, hashtag COVID-48, uh, killing the uh, Palestinians. Again, uh, COVID-48, so again, conflating COVID-19, uh, which is an alleged Jewish creation, Soros or what have you, with um, COVID.
COVID, uh, uh, excuse me, the Foundation of Israel. Again, this one's quite simple. The Israeli plane dropping COVID onto the Palestinians. Uh, here's a Palestinian woman. You see her, she's wearing, she's being forced into a COVID field. Uh, in this all righty. Um, at this point, uh, uh, Jeff, I, I could go on, but I'm at my time limit. So I think if, if it's fine with you, I would just stop. Uh, but that's that's really um, that's fine. Um, okay. And I appreciate, I appreciate you. And I want to let everyone know that when I first was introduced to Jeffrey, I heard his lecture and it was quite stunning to me. Uh, I knew some of what uh, Jeffrey was talking about, but I wanted to share what is sort of underneath the manhole covers, which are now popping out. And I think it was important for you to be able to all uh, benefit from what Jeffrey has brought to the table. Uh, we certainly, you'll stick around for Q&A and I'm sure this group will have some questions for you. I'm gonna continue the program um, here. Uh, sorry. situation was. I was deported with a big amount of my family, my mother, my father, an uncle, and a, a, a sister with her husband and two kids. They all went to the gas chambers. Out of 13 of my immediate family, I'm the only one who came back. For the 10 minutes that I work or 15 minutes that I sang, they forgot who they were. And that was the most important thing. And that's what made me being alive. <laughs> now, the first camp when we entertained the SS, they didn't come. We only entertained for the inmates. But the second came. Why the SS came to see us? All, all I can deduct then is like uh, they had such a terrible life hitting us and killing us that they wanted to be entertained too. The camps, in certain cases, had a cabaret, but they would never put on anything. That, that mentioned gas chambers or the mass murder squads. It was subversive by nature, but you had to be very careful how you did it. So the SS guards who came would not understand that they were the ones who were being spoken about. It's the kind of humor that'll make you cry. Really, the underpinning is sadness. I was in the cabinet. And it was very funny, very witty. Of course, people were laughing. People were laughing and talking about it the next morning, and how did you like so-and-so? Of course, well, we imagine that we live in a normal time. There was a song which we have adopted as our anthem. It went something like, let's join hands, we shall overcome. When the tyranny ends, we shall all dance on the ruins of Terezin. Well, sadly, very few would have been able to do so. What did you do all morning? What did I do all morning? I don't know. I just stuck my head off. 
You did? Did you, did you talk about how funny the camp was? Oh, God, yes. <laughs> it was hilarious. From the moment we put our feet in the camp, we were laughing. We never stopped laughing. We woke up in the morning at 3, even when we, even when the, when they make us walk, even when they make us walk in the middle of the night, we laughed to say, ha, 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 he'll get you there. <laughs> Let's talk about the television show you used to do. What television show? I've about strange. the concentration camp. What concentration camp? <laughs> Who walked into a producer's office and said, here's the idea, a group of soldiers in a Nazi prison camp. It's a comedy. Do you think that Hogan's Zero was about a concentration camp? It was about the camp. And there were no Jews in the... I didn't play a Jewish kid. No, there were no Jews in it, but there were Nazis in oh, it. Oh, the Thank you. Hogan's Zero was about prisoner of war in a stalag. It was not about genocide. It was not Jews going to the... No, of to course the, to not. the gas we chambers. We knew that. No, but a lot of people... That's did. why it was so funny. But yeah, but I know, but they're asking, that they always ask me, how could you have done Hogan's Eagles after what you went through? Je te plumerai le coup, je te plumerai le coup, et la tête... How did it end? We all died. <laughs> <laughs> now, when you're going to die, you're, uh, you're going to be in a, a, in a Jewish cemetery, you're going to be a... Bar next to my husband, I have uh -huh. a place next to my husband. Not, I'm not going next to my wife. So where are you going? In the ocean, even though I'm a Pisces and I don't know no, how to swim. No, you're not going to be creamy. Yes, I am. No, you're not. Don't tell me what to do in now, my you life. See, you see, that, that I what? could not, I cannot imagine. Then are you, you, you going to stop talking to me or you want to try my soup? Here, try my <laughs> soup. Maybe you'll change your mind. I, I, uh, yes, I, absolutely. You know what I said? I said to Rabbi Hayer once, we were talking about that. I say, uh, he said, uh, uh, you, I said, I'm going to be committed. He said, you cannot do that. I say. What about my parents? And that cut him down. I'm going to be cremated, and then the fish going to eat me. I think I said, mmm, I'm wanting wonderful French food. Mmm, <laughs> yum, yum, yum. <laughs> Little. I know I have blo Polish blood in me. <laughs> What's that, lady? This is um, a program about uh, the Jewish culture and Holocaust remembrance. And it's about. So, um, okay. I want to share with you the woman in that film. Uh, and let me just do something really quickly. Give me one second. Okay, so you're all back with us. Um, the woman in the feel, uh, film, you may know her. She is uh, Renee Firestone. What's unique about Renee, she's a Holocaust survivor. She's 99 years old. She knew my mother. Uh, they both uh, lived in Allentown, Pennsylvania. And it was quite surprising when I found this film and Renee was on it. And I know my mother and her were friendly. She eventually uh, founded a uh, fashion business and moved to Los Angeles. Uh, and so we were seeing some clips of uh, Renee Firestone because it's enjoyable. Of my, my memories of my mom talking about Renee was as I was growing up. And then there's a few more. I'm going to take a quick break and I want to try to get um, Linda Hooper's program so we can benefit from that. So just give me two seconds and I'll see if I can figure this out. So I'll be right back. He came and she had the same stereotype cost here because we think it would do Okay, so give me a second. Here we go. Um, about, I'd say 92% of our people are white, Protestant, um, 
evangelical Protestant. Within a mile of this school, there are 12 churches. So that sort of could give you some idea about how evangelical we are here. Um, as I became principal of Whitwell Middle School and just started looking around and thinking about how vast the world is, we live in the Sequatchie Valley, which is surrounded by two mountain ranges, and it's about 120 miles long. It's pretty well isolated. We have students here who, when I first became the principal, had never been outside the valley. I suspect there are still students like that here. Our uh, median income is very low. We, uh, about 77% of our students qualify for free and reduced lunches. So, you know, that kind of gives you an idea of who we are. So in 1998, I just started taking a look at our demographics and thinking, these kids are gonna live in a much larger world. There was no Facebook, no Instagram, no Twitter to connect them to anything. Thank goodness, because I think they were missed out a lot. So I, I just started looking and thinking and talking to our school improvement council and saying, you know, what do you think we can do? What do we need to do? And, and we all agreed that our children need to be exposed to more diversity, understand that, you know, not everybody lived in a white community that was small enough that they were cared about. Um, I guarantee you, if you were a kid here during that time and you did something ungodly, somebody would have reported it to your family or your teachers or, you know, some adult before the day was over. And it would have been dealt with in one way or the other. So I started looking around and I found this group called the I Earn Foundation. And they connected high school students uh, with uh, with uh, online to study different topics. And I noticed there was a topic about the Holocaust and that that summer they were bringing that topic to Chattanooga, Tennessee. I also knew that if high school students could do it, my eighth grade, seventh, eighth grade students could do the same thing. They could study, they were sharp enough to, to take part in that. So I asked David Smith, who was the assistant principal, to go to this um, study group that was happening in Chattanooga. And he came back with the materials. We went to our school improvement council, that's parents, teachers, community members, everybody, and said, we are considering <clears throat> a study of the Holocaust here because we think it would do what we, number one, what we want it to do. Number one, it would introduce us to a diverse culture because I have my doubts that anybody in Whitwell, Tennessee knew a lot about Jewish people or their culture at that time. Number two, it would show how your just small actions snowball into really big actions and how little it takes to influence people. Number three, we had hopes that it would stop some instances of bullying stop, make people's kids stop and think and teachers stop and think about the things they say and the things they do. So I went to Sandra Roberts who taught eighth grade social studies and I said, I have the best idea. Now y'all to run, anybody ought to run number one if a principal says that and number one, if number two, if that principal happens to be me, get your skates on and get the hell out of there. So I said to Sandra Roberts, I'd like for us to start an after school study about the Holocaust. And um, kids would have to sign up voluntarily. Uh, you won't get paid. And some adult from their um, family or some adult that they know will have to agree to come with them the first year. And the reason I let, added that last caveat is because I did not want this super evangelical community to decide that I was promoting a Jewish conversion experience here, okay? So I also said, now I'll give you a comp time and other things if you will do this and we'll see where it goes. So that year we had, I think about 30 kids. I don't remember exact numbers. I've 
I've been kind of in the hospital the last week and I don't have the clearest brain. You know, once you've had anesthesia, your brain never works again. So we started with these parents. And as we studied, it was a revelation to everybody. One child in the group came from a Jehovah's Witness family and her family did not realize that Jehovah's Witnesses were one of the groups that was targeted by the Nazis. So it, it was a wonderful experience. Our School Improvement Council got behind it 100%. The parents who, were, who came and the children were just 100% behind it. We decided we would do it again the next year, but we would not make an adult come. They could come if they wished, but they would not be required to come. So along about the middle of that next year, one of the students came to me, came into my office and said, Miss Hooper, I just don't get six million. I can't, I can't comprehend six million. And I could understand that because at that time there was the population of Tennessee was 6.2 million. So you're trying to comprehend something that would wipe out everybody in their whole state. She said, can we collect something that will help us to grasp this quantity, this number of people? And I said, you have my permission if, number one, it has to relate to the Holocaust. And number two, it can't just be some junky Coke caps, something like that, you know, you have to. And number three, I have to see the letter. She said, oh, I already have a letter ready. And I said, well, when you get what you're going to collect into that letter, because she had a very good letter, come back. Within a couple of days, she was back and she said, Miss Hooper, we're going to collect paper clips. Now, what would be your first thought? Paper clips are probably the most common thing you ever think about. You know, I see them now all the time. The other day I was walking in the parking lot of the hospital and there lay a paper clip of my car. And I said, give me the reason. She said, Miss Hooper, and I love it when kids act like you don't have a brain in the world because I didn't have a clue why paper clips. And she knew it. And she was going to play her trump card. She said, do you not know that Joseph Baylor, a Norwegian gentleman, is credited with the invention of the paper clips? And that during World War II, Norwegians wore them on their lapels uh, as a symbol of resistance to the Nazis. And of course, I did not know that. So she had her fresh letter ready. We made a list of people we're going to send them out to. We sent them out to all our congressional people, our state officials, uh, any famous person they could think of. And we began to get replies. <clears throat> now, some of them were really interesting. And I'm going to start with the we can't send you a paper clip first. From many major league sports teams, we got letters that say, uh, we appreciate your efforts, but we are unable to send you a paper clip. Now that really kind of got my, as we say in the South, drawers in a wad, because you've, you, somebody has taken the time to write a letter stick it in an envelope, address it, put a stamp in it. You know they had a paper clip laying there. Why didn't they just stick it in the envelope? We got a similar letter from similar uh, Senator Al Gore's office at that time. Now I'm a dedicated Democrat, guys, and if that insults you, I don't really care. But anyway, just a little while after that, I was at a gathering of Democrats and his state chairman, Came, people were talking about paper clips, and the state chairman came over to me, uh, Senator Gores, and said, Oh, I'm sure you have a paper clip from Senator Gore. And I said, Oh, I'm sure we don't, because his office said they were unable to send one. Would you like to see the letter? And she, he said, uh, 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 No, thank you. Within a week, Senator Gore paid us a visit and brought several paper clips, okay? But the clips that mean the most to us are clips that came from survivors. 
and survivors' families and told their stories. We have collected, we, our original goal was to collect six million, one for every name that the Nazis recorded when they, and they were very meticulous about recording the names of victims. They recorded their name, how they murdered them, when they murdered them, and how they disposed of the body. All the facts they had about the survivors, they recorded for six million people that were Jewish and five million other people that were not Jewish. People who just stood up and said, what you're doing is wrong, or who worked in the underground to try to stop what was going on. Um, those stories are contained in, <clears throat> Emily will take the, in a second, she will take the uh, iPad over and show you the, those letters that we have filed. We have over 30, thousand of those letters. We stopped counting paper clips when we reached 30 million. We still receive them and we still treat them with great care. A lot, several of them we sent out across the country to schools that requested uh, to start their own small collections or to start their own stories or to talk about when they showed the movie. And uh, we sent out about um, 30, 40,000 paper clips that, that way. We have a, a butterfly dish in our office here at the school where you can take a, butter, a, a paper clip as you leave if you wish to, and we have people who do that all the time. So, people always want to know how the movie came to be. <laughs> and how the car got here. Well, I'm gonna tell you the bottom line of it all is we have never been in charge of this project. Um, God's hand has been on it from the beginning, whether we want to admit it or not, because you can't tell me that a community like this with no resources out in the middle of nowhere could have a project like this if not. So, at any rate, we registered our project with the National Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. And Lena Gitter, who was a 90 plus year old survivor at that time, saw the registration. She called up her friends, Peter and Dagmar Schroeder, who were correspondents for a Washington newspaper. And she simply said, and I love this because I can just see her saying it. it. Sounds like something I might say if I had known Peter and Dagmar Schroeder, she said, you are going to Whitville, Tennessee, and you are going to write about these children and their project, and you are going to ensure that they get six million paper clips. Well, they did exactly what she said. They came to Whitville, Tennessee. They wrote, they then called their friend, Dita Smith, who worked for the Washington Post, and uh, they said to Dita Smith, you need to go and you need to write about this because the Washington Post gets read more than anything we would ever write. So she did, she came and she had the same stereotypes that Peter and Dagmar had, uh, that we were, you know, <clears throat> a bunch of redneck, Southern, whatever people think of us stereotypically. She was very surprised. She went back, she wrote her article. When the article came out, Rachel Pinchot was having her morning tea and she started reading the article. She immediately called up her husband, Ari, and she said, Ari, you, your company, the Johnson Group, has to make a documentary about these students. Get to Tennessee get the signatures on the line and make the documentary. So he started calling. Now, we've not been portrayed really nicely in the press in the past. We're a former coal mining community and we had, you know, the kind of publicity that goes with a coal mining community. And I wasn't the least bit thrilled about uh, having a documentary made. Number one, 
I figured they would paint us again as a redneck coal mining community. But number two, and probably just as important and maybe more important, I did not want the, the motive for the project, the object, the goal of the project to be lost in anybody's ego because, ooh, I got to be in a movie. You know, I made a national screen somewhere. The whole object of this, this project, I think is summed up in a poem, and you can look it up by Gertrude Hildreth Hausman called The Gift of Choice. But it, it emphasizes the fact that each of us every day makes choices. Do we respect people? No matter, I don't have to like you. Nothing in my Bible, nothing in my teaching tells me I have to. Sorry, I'm going to work on this in a minute. Just give me a chance to fix this.
or Bale, Germany. They raised the funds to buy it, convinced the museum there to sell it to them, convinced the German railroad people to transport it to the port of Cuxhaven, convinced the German Navy to bring it to the port of Baltimore, convinced CSX Railroad to transport it to Whitwell, and by the way, or rather to Chattanooga, by the way, it was in transit, as you saw in the movie on 9-11. So when it got to Chattanooga, B&B uh, &B Trucking uh, brought it here or brought it to our old school and set it up on tracks that had been provided by CSX Railroad, which were from that time period. Um, there's no way that I think I could adequately describe how I felt then and how I feel now. It took me several days to enter the car. You could feel those lives that had been in there. I tried to think we had survivors who had been here before who told us that they had been in a car like that with 150 people. That car is nine feet, approximately by 22 feet. That would have been the entire number of my seventh and eighth grade students, no, my eighth grade students. Four classrooms of kids. I, I tried to visualize how you would ever, no sanitary facilities. We take so much for granted. You know, I was just thinking the other day, just to be able to, to get a, a glass of water be able to go to the bathroom when you want, to be able to be clean, to have any kind of food. It took me forever to go in there. The gentleman who did the glasswork that you'll see behind which the paper clips were stored, when he first came, the floor was absolutely, you know, it was in, it was in a bad shape. It had traveled a long way and the floor was cracked and so on and so forth. And he said, Ms. Hooper, you're going to have to replace this floor. I said, I don't have any money. And he said, okay. The next day he came back and completely replaced the floor and never said a word, never said, you know, you got to pay me, you got to this, you got to that. He just did it. That's the kind of thing that we, the kind of help when we needed something, it's always been there whether it was people to speak, people to work, people to plan. Um, you know, families came together and made it pretty around it. A gentleman in our community donated the fence that surrounds it. A local artist made some of the, she made stepping stones of butterflies to put all around it. And they were painted. And as the paint got bad, um, a stained glass artist said she would at no charge replace and, and you know, put the color back on the butterflies. And the amazing thing to me about these butterflies is that when you look at them, there are actual butterflies in these colors somewhere on the face of the earth. They're not just something they made up. Emily worked <clears throat> on these stained glass windows. Why don't you turn that around? So that can you see these stained glass windows? No, we're looking at the ceiling, so you have to move it down a little bit. That's better. Yes. Got it. If you can get a little closer to it, too, it makes sense to you can move it closer to the windows. Yes, it's coming into focus now. Ah, now we can really see it. That's great. One of them is simply paper clips. The next one is the this barbed wire with the, the holders for the barbed wire fencing around a camp with butterflies. The next one is a rail car with the Jewish star. And the other one is Iris and a long view of the railroad track going to a camp. So we have those four. Then we have stained glass windows of, that you can't see from here. We'll show them to you at the bottom that are. Um, our coal mine in history and some other historical places here. So 
Oh, gosh, where are we? What do you want to know now? Well, why don't you tell us a little bit about the letters? You were going to talk about the letters. And, and also, I want to include in that discussion the letters that are not so nice. Oh, yes, we do want. These are all, let's see. These the letters that are from survivors start with number 67 and go through number 69. So they would be right here. And they are, well, they just break your heart. We have celebrity letters. We have one of those. They're from people like um, Tom Bosley, other famous people. And that one's right there. And then there are these. Of the 30,000 letters we have, of the communications we've had with people, these are the only negative comments we've ever had. And I think one of the questions that so was Emily, if you can show that we're not seeing the we're not seeing it. So there you go. Okay. There, uh, thank you. There it is. Come over here, Emily, and I'll try to open up. And this, what what room are we looking at behind us? Is this, this is there a this name room. of this room? We call this the artifacts room. This is where everything anybody has ever sent to us resides. Now we have hopes. <laughs> Somebody once said that if Linda Hooper gets a vision, run. My vision, we own eight and a half acres that the city of Whitwell has given us, where we hope in the next five years to put our library, our city library, which is in a building now that's falling in, our miners museum, our Holocaust museum, our veterans memorial, and our senior citizens all on one plot of land. And we're currently raising fund, funds for that. But just kind of do a little panoram in way of, of things that are in here. We'll talk about some of them. Stop right there. Yeah, I wanted, I was just about to mention that. Thank you. This is a, <coughs> a Torah that was originally written in Pajwa, Lithuania. I got to get to breath here. Take your time. Oh, if Wayne did in World War II, it was carried to Johannesburg, South Africa. From there, it went to Toronto, Canada. And in Canada, they no longer had a congregation that could use it, you know, if it damaged, touched, all the things that make it not suitable for a, for a synagogue. So the gentleman called and asked me if we would like to have it. And of course, we were thrilled to have this Torah. The art that it's in was donated to us by the Jewish communities in Chattanooga. Next to it, this is a tree of life that was made by Martin Small for his wife on one of their anniversaries. And this tree contains 86 paper clips. Each paper clip represents the life of a relative of either he or his uh, wife that was destroyed during the Holocaust. She and her daughter brought it to us to give to us the tree of life. Um, let's go ahead while we're talking. We'll go back to the nasty letters in a minute. We have an authentic uh, jacket that was worn during one of the camps. And if you look closely, you can see that there is a red triangle. If you were not Jewish, you had a triangle of some color. Purple was for Jehovah's Witnesses, the red was for political prisoners. And we notice that this jacket has two numbers, one on top of the other. And you can see how one of them's been pulled off, so you can see there's one underneath. So when the first prisoner died, they didn't bother to clean up the jacket. They just simply put another number on. It's beyond my, this is beyond my comprehension. One gentleman donated to us his yellow star that he wore uh, during the Holocaust. 
So let's take a little quick back to the nasty letters. If I had time this morning, I would have gotten the one tab that says, here's your paper clip. And it's bent into the shape of a swastika, but I don't see it in a, but. Well, let me ask you, you don't have to point it out. We all know that it's all there. Uh, have, you, have you seen incidents? Um, and I know this is, we've had COVID and it's been a challenging time for everyone, but perhaps you can tell us how many visitors you had before COVID hit a year. Oh, before COVID hit, we would have, oh gosh, 30,000 more. Probably somewhere around forty thousand people who would who would come for guided tours. Now you can go to the local grocery before COVID, get a key to the car, and the car is wired for sound. Uh, that was done by the Sam's Clubs in several states surrounding us, and listen to um, me talk about the car and the things in the car. So we would have another five, 10,000 people who would come that way. This morning when I drove up, there were two ladies from Atlanta um, who had come here on their way back. From, they, they'd been visiting in Chattanooga and they were on their way back from, to Atlanta. One of them was a Montessori teacher from Argentina and they had just shown up. We have not allowed people since last March to come in here or to come to the car because of COVID. And we are right now having a horrible, we've had a horrible time this summer with starlings. So if you see bird poop when Emily goes out to the car, don't think it's because we're not taking care. It's because we have been really working hard and we have the guy who says we'll never see another starling again coming Monday. <laughs> he better be telling me the truth. <laughs> then we're, all right, I want to ask you before that maybe Emily can make her make her way out to the car. But in the meantime, I have both Cheryl and uh, Cheryl and um, Jan can maybe unmute yourself and it, and you three of you can talk about uh, Cheryl and Jan's um, trip to uh, to Whitwell and why you went out. And Jan, I think it would be a fabulous little bit of a transition here to kind of talk about how you saw the movie and you know from there and go ahead. Okay. Um, hello, everybody. Um, how could you not be inspired by Linda Hooper? And seeing paper clips, um, I had the opportunity when I was working at the Jewish Academy, San Diego Jewish Academy, to um, see the film along with the senior class and sitting there and just being absolutely amazed by what uh, her students accomplished and thinking that here I was working at the one of the largest Jewish day schools or the largest Jewish day school in San Diego. And yet we had nothing on our campus to commemorate the Holocaust. And so that really paper clips was my inspiration uh, for the butterfly project. I went back to the board of the academy and I said, we need to have something uh, here on our campus that will be uh, not threatening because we have a campus of, at that time it was kindergarten through 12th grade. Now it's preschool through 12th grade. We want the kids to remember what happened, but we also want them to have hope that um, if we treat each other with, you know, with respect and kindness, that something like this won't happen again to anyone. And the board approved my um, request. And from there, um, I remembered a poem that I read uh, about a young man who was in a, the, a ghetto and mentioned that he had never seen a butterfly there. That, that butterfly was the, the last one. So it, in a, it's in a, a book of poetry and artwork by children in Terezin concentration camp. And I thought about a butterfly representing hope and freedom and the fragility of life and that that would be a perfect um, symbol for any kind of memorial that we would create on our campus. And that's when I approached um, Cheryl 
Ratner Price, a parent and an artist. She had done some beautiful, beautiful artwork on our campus. And um, I approached her about my, my goal of wanting 1.5 million butterflies, one for each child that was murdered in the Holocaust to be um, on our campus, representative on our campus. And um, if you see the movie um, that Cheryl made called Not the Last Butterfly, uh, you would see that my first, um, I guess, thinking about what the butterfly should look like. I wanted all the butterflies to be on our campus. And I had created one out of wire uh, with my calcium pill in the middle, um, thinking that, you know, we have to do this, obviously 1.5 million with the school budget. How is that going to be uh, something that we can, we can have? And Cheryl basically was very kind and didn't laugh, um, just said we can't do it this way and came up with the idea of having ceramic butterflies, something that would be long lasting and beautiful. And as the project developed, which we'll talk about later, um, she convinced me that the butterflies needed to be at the places where people were making them and not all of them coming back to the Jewish Academy. So that's uh, in a nutshell. How oh, that's I'm great. So before you answer Cheryl, uh, Linda, I know that you're um, not, you're, you're on the weather. So if you feel that you have to leave and um, take your leave, it's perfectly fine with us. We all understand. I do want to give Saul the opportunity if, if in fact you choose to want to go, Saul, maybe you can unmute yourself and you wanted to say something to Linda and, and also explain to the group what, what the background of the story is. Um, Linda, it's, it's a privilege to, uh, to have the ability to speak to you and uh, to thank you for uh, all you've done. Um, I, uh, I was part of those letters that came from when my mom and dad were alive because I'm a second generation survivor. My, both my parents were uh, victims of the Holocaust and uh, I actually wrote a book from Brooklyn to, uh, from Bergen-Belsen to Brooklyn. And uh, it, it gave me the opportunity to send the uh, the book to you to have for your library. And uh, I, uh, with your permission, Linda, I'd like to read the thank you that you sent me because it was so heartwarming, heartwarming, and uh, so inspirational to me. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and read it. And it says, uh, "Dear Dr. Pincheski." No words can adequately express my gratitude to you for donating your book from Bergen-Belsen to Brooklyn to our library. It was an honor and an inspiration to read about the strong women in your family. Their dedication, positive attitude, and love of family warmed my spirit over, uh, once I started reading, I could not put the book down. Grateful and thanks, Linda. And uh, she sent it on a uh, on the stationery, which she mentioned earlier from Gertrude Hausman, uh, with with the wonderful uh, expression about uh, inspiration from uh, you know people, a and uh, I I just thank you, and uh, I I also wanted to tell you that I was very upset that, uh, that you were hospitalized, and uh, Jeff told me about it, and. Uh, I, uh, when I was at services yesterday, it, interesting that you have a Torah there. Uh, on Mondays, Thursdays, and Saturdays, we read from the Torah. And part of the uh, opening of the Torah, we have a uh, prayer that we say for those that aren't well. So since I knew yesterday that you were uh, ill, uh, we said what, what's, what's called a Misha Beirach, which is actually hoping for your quick and speedy recovery. And I'm glad to see you today, and God bless you. Thank you so much. That, that means a great deal. I, uh, my husband and I, for the past, since March, have had, <laughs> I told him we spent more time with the doctors than each other. Please pray for my husband too. He has developed something called acquired hemophilia A, which
we did get good news yesterday that he is in remission. So we're hopeful he can stay in remission. Uh, but, we all we all hope that uh, for him as well. Correct. And um, obviously, Linda, you know, we don't want, we, I am so grateful that you, you're such a hero to be able to come out of the hospital yesterday and to join us today. Uh, <laughs> that is uh, uh, unbelievable. So uh, as I'm they just... say, as they say, the show must go on, but you've taken the show to a much higher level. No, I, as my husband says, I was born uber responsible. It's just, <laughs> you know, I was, I was in the hospital telling them, you're going to have to go get my um, iPad because I have this thing coming up on Friday. And my daughter-in-law saying that isn't going to happen. But you don't know what hard-headed old women can do. So is there anything else in this room you'd like to see before I... Um, I don't know if Emily is out at the... Is, is she out she's or she's here? She's... Yes, I'm out at the, at the car now. Go ahead. So, Emma, could, it, could, it, could I just ask Linda for her husband's name so when we do our prayers, I can ask for a prayer for him as well? Yes. What is it? What's her husband's name, Linda? Your husband's Ed. name. My husband is Edward. Edward. Edward Hooper? Edward Hooper, yes. All okay. Right. Very good. Thank, Thank you. you. And Emily, are you going to show us the outside? Yes, I am. Um, okay. I'm on a on a iPhone, so if you need okay. me to adjust the camera, right. just, okay, just good. <laughs> yes, we can see you now. Go ahead. Okay. All right. So um, outside the floor now, um, this is the entrance way. Um, I have a bit of a knee injury, so <laughs> if I'm a little wobbly, it's because I have a little bit of a a limp. But um, I'm going to go on the side now, so you can see um, we have paper clips on both sides enclosed in glass. Um, I'll start on one side and then I can move on to the other side so you can see. Um, you can see, of course, all of the paper clips. Uh, it is completely full all the way down to the bottom within the case. Um, on this side, we have a suitcase with uh, luggage tags, which carry on each of the luggage tags in the suitcase. There is um, apologies to Anne Frank from students in Germany that were sent to us to display in the car. Um, there are also some, I can open the case here so you can see a little better. You can also see some laying on top of the here. Um, I'm just going to put the camera in here so you can see a little bit better. This is one side. All right, now moving to the other side now. Switch. Yeah, you don't mind. Leave on So one of one of one of you is having feedback. So one yeah, of them. I had to, she brought the iPad outside, so I okay. had the phone so it wouldn't echo. And I'm going to open the case so you can see a little better through the glass here. This is on the opposite side of the car with different artifacts. Um, we have so Emily and Linda. Many of um, the audience, including my parents or my mother, traveled in one of these uh, cattle cars. And when I first saw um, this cattle car, I thought of my mother traveling from Kosice, Czechoslovakia with her family mm -hmm. to Auschwitz. And I know that many of the people who are with us also had family who were deported and many of them perished, most perished, some of them survived. And it is absolutely chilling to be mm -hmm. in this car with you and for our audience to be able to firsthand get a glimpse of a cattle car, which for me is the first time in my life that I have been able to see this. Right. So we're thanking you so much for your ability to give us this touch, even though it's virtual. It is most, most appreciated. 
but go ahead if you want to tell us anything about the car. Um, if you have any questions, I can try to answer those. Uh, we have, I don't know if you can see through the glass, it's a little hard to reach there. We have some binders open to some different letters um, within the case here. Yes, okay. some different okay, and so we're back live and I was able to luckily be able to pull uh, this program from my library of over 130 uh, programs. So I, um, I apologize that Linda couldn't um, be with us uh, personally, but I was able to bring her uh, virtually through a recording, uh, which is pretty much what she would have uh, done today. So that leaves us with a uh, an amazing uh, opportunity to discuss what you've seen today. So I'm gonna open up the chat and uh, we're close to the end of the program. And if there's anybody who would like to comment, um, please uh, raise your hand and uh, let me know. So, okay. Well, it doesn't like look like there's comments. I think this is a very, this program leaves you kind of like uh, breathless. And I hope that um, you benefited from seeing what Jeffrey uh, Dembski had to um, share with us. And Yifat from Israel is over there. So uh, hi, Yifat. And I wanted to let you know to look for an email from me. I saw your father's book and discussion in a film, which was totally blew my mind. So I just sent you the email over the weekend. So check it out. And Yeah, I have seen it. And hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. I, I didn't have time to respond. I just thought that the lady who's uh, uh, done, uh, it's about her. She lives in the States now, and I think her life project is quite interesting, perhaps one day in one of your programs. Yeah, well, that's, thank you. And you remind me of the name of the film. I, it's in that email, so you can let everyone know. It, I'm trying to remember. Uh, uh, a day in the lifetime, I think. A day in the life. Yeah, day in the life. It's on in the life. It's on five films. I don't know if you're familiar with chaiflix.com. It's a paid Jewish movie service, which I, uh, I'm i a member of. And they have um, literally, if you want to go to every film festival, Jewish film festival in the world, you can go to a high flicks and never have enough Jewish content. You can, But there was an amazing movie that uh, I shared with Yifad is the daughter of Thomas Jeeves, and Thomas Jeeves wrote an amazing book called The Boy Who Drew Auschwitz. And just so coincidentally, um, Yifad presented this book to our group somewhere, I think, in 2021 or 2022, I don't recall. And while I was watching this film, all of a sudden, um, the, the school teacher um, brought this book to her students. So again, it's a very, very small world. And I see Tibor and and Devora and 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 Joan and Eva. I'm glad you stayed with us, Eva. So I see that the program maybe caught your attention and you wanted to hang out. And and there's Judith and all my friends and Ruth. Nice to see you. And I noticed on the RSV playlist there were two other Lindemans, but I didn't know if they were able to come. I think your two daughters were scheduled to come. Uh yes, yes. All right, just so you know, the recording will be available tomorrow. And I also want to let you know the recording with Tibor's presentation is now streaming live. Uh, and it's being advertised by me in our newsletter, if you're interested. And I hope you that you come on to jchr.com and see the Jewish content that I'm curating around the world every day. So uh, it's another one of my projects. Hello, Mark. Nice to see you as well. And so I think we'll call this a day and uh, we'll see you next month. Next month. Thank you, Jeffrey. It was very interesting as usual. Okay, I let me tell you it. quickly uh, something. Hold on. Um, our program is on June 25th and it's called Rays of Hope. And in, in presenting will be uh, Jennifer Steele, Keith Newhouse, the son of uh, Mark Newhouse, and Blima Lorba from, uh, and Jennifer's coming in from the UK, and Blima's coming in from Brazil. 
We'll be presenting some really interesting topics. I'll be starting to advertise this in detail. So we'll see you uh, in June. Take care, everyone. Love you. Bye now. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. It was Bye -bye. amazing.